Okay. Well, welcome everybody to our BA Insight session on requirements elicitation. I'm pleased to have uh, two uh, two guests from the BA world, uh, the world of business analysis, maybe joined by a third midway through our call as well. But I'm not going to introduce them. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So, so can I can I ask you to introduce yourself first, please? Okay. So my name is Karolina Zmitrovic. Uh, the surname is, I believe, not too easy for you. Uh, I am from Poland and I am in BA world since 2005 or something. Uh, I am mostly involved in, I would say, business analysis at strategic level, but sometimes I am also involved in project. And what I really like to take care about is I like to take care about well quality requirements, starting from elicitation. So I believe that this is why I am here. And what else is quite interesting, I would say, is that I am a member of IREP, uh, Requirements Engineering Qualification Board, and we are together. We are trying to make the best what we can to standardize this area uh, around the world. So Thank I'm you. glad to, to be here. Brilliant. Thank you for your introduction. And over to you, Finn. Uh, my name is Thea Soren. Uh, I've been with the IBA for 15 years. I've been doing business analysis for almost 30 now. Uh, I helped write the Babock, and I've been with the Tampa Bay chapter of the IBA for two years. We have almost 100 study groups on YouTube if anyone wants to learn the Babock. Um, let's get started. Excellent. Uh, and I'll be sure to uh, to take those links and share them around as well. That's for sure. Thank you. And uh, we're both organisations, not just the IBA. So let's get the, the ball rolling in. This, the topic is talking about requirement solicitation. So I think what better place to start with them really, you know, what approaches do you both use for um, for eliciting report analysis? So what would you, you propose are, are good techniques and approaches to use for eliciting information analysis? Well, of course start. you start yeah. with, with understanding what the goal of the project is. Uh, you get that information first from the people that are bankrolling the project, and then you identify who the stakeholders are that they believe. And then as you talk to each person and you ask the questions of what do you need, what are your pain points, who else will this impact, who else should I talk to, you expand your stakeholders and you document your stakeholder analysis. Uh, documenting requirements is going to be different for every single project the techniques that you use because different projects have different types of requirements. Uh, some people make it very simple and don't have a lot of requirements and they can use things like Excel. Other people have a huge amount of requirements and they need something a little more robust. And, and what do you think about like, in terms of the act of gathering the requirements before we define, do you have, um, what, what different techniques might you typically expect people to use or could they use? Well, interviews are the easiest way, but interviews take a lot of time and they require a lot of scheduling. There are surveys, there are um, doing document analysis, uh, there's sitting side by side with people, there's all kinds of observations. Uh, the BAPOC has 50 different techniques and about half of those are about gathering requirements. you would be pleased to know here, I won't be asking you to, to call those all out, but I'm sure people can read through every one yes. of the 50, but, but definitely some some fine examples there uh, and those I'm familiar with as well, of course, which is you know about interviewing people, running surveys. I think I'll give Carolina a chance as well before I rattle off a few more examples, but uh, no, that's an excellent start. Thank you. And Carolina, would you like to add a little okay. bit more in terms of your perspective on different yeah. approaches that you tend to use for you, this? Team? You know, from my perspective, before talking about any approach, the first thing that we need to understand is to understand the context, the, the context of a solution that we are working on. And because the context actually can implicate what is the source of requirements and what approach could be used. Yeah. So uh, instead of starting talking with people, with stakeholders, my first step would be to understand, of course, the project goal, because this is something that is crucial, the project goal, the assumption, and so on, and understand the system context. And within the system context, you have stakeholders, but you also have documentation. You also have systems that you can use as a source of requirements. Yeah, And in many cases, instead of, sorry for saying that, instead of wasting time of your stakeholders, you can collect really a lot of information by studying the documentation. Yeah, So 
this is for me the first step. And this step is basically about planning the elicitation process. Then, of course, after planning, I know what is the source of requirements, who could be asked or what can be analyzed. Then I can think about the relevant techniques. Yeah, and the techniques, of course, we can use a lot of them. They are, they are mentioned in Babo Guide, they are mentioned in IREP, they are mentioned in ma ma many standards. Yeah, But for me, a technique is a tool. And without understanding the goal, you cannot talk about any tool. And that makes absolute sense. And, and, and I mean, I, I, I've got an example, actually. I mean, we tend to, like if we were doing uh, analysis on a very, uh, with technology as an example, and I knew that I was going to deliver a set of requirements to technology, before I start engaging the, the business stakeholders and asking them a load of questions, it's often useful to speak to the technology team to find out, well, actually, how do they work? How would they like to receive the, the requirements and the information? But also, do they have any particular questions or uh, yeah, questions that they might want to ask the business or areas for me to investigate? So then I'm armed with uh, uh, those particular questions before I speak to the business. It, calls, it stops me going backwards and forwards, and I think to your point, Carolina, stops me wasting time of the business, which is typically yes. uh, quite valuable. Time. Especially in the, another example, if you will think about well, not so, let's say, user uh, uh, systems with uh, front end to users, with dedicated for users, systems that are embedded, like systems that you have in your car. Yeah, Actually, the stakeholder is not the source of information. Standards are regulations. Yeah, And talking with the customer, like talking with the Mercedes, yeah, Mercedes uh, share or whatever, makes absolutely no sense because this is not the level of abstraction that we are talking about. That's it. Yeah. And that's certainly a valid point because uh, if uh, irrespective of the approach, you're fundamentally speaking to the wrong audience, then the approach is not of any value at all. Yeah, makes makes absolute sense. I mean, uh, what, what, I mean one other example I think is uh, I tend to, to think about as well is that, you know, sometimes with our, depending on what the product is you're delivering and the part of the analysis you're delivering as well, your analysis, your, your elicitation approach will often change. You know, so for example, if I were focusing entirely on a, a inter-system interface, for example, versus a uh, an application or a screen or a call or something tangible, my approaches would be quite different. Because if I'm looking at something that has a physical output, like a report, it often works for me anyway to sit down with the business and actually start to draw out what it is that they would like to see as their end product and how they might, might want to use it, theoretically, rather than uh, try and draw the, the final design of the system but at least to get some concepts that around the sort of thing that they expect to do and the functionality or capabilities they expect from the system. No, that's for sure. Okay. And, uh, and, and it'd be interesting to get your perspective on, on how you think business analysts can improve their elicitation techniques. And perhaps we'll start with uh, fear on that. Maybe. Well, improving your elicitation requires you to do your own private retrospective and perhaps with a couple of other BAs or people that understand uh, licitation. But you need to look at what you did and what you could have done better. And especially if requirements were missed or found late, look at why they were missed or found late. And uh, I appreciate finding those for myself, but I also appreciate working with a team of other BAs so that we help each other, we sharpen each other. And we, you know, if I say, you know, I, I miss this and I miss this because of the X, Y, and Z, they won't have make the same mistake. Um, it's it's the only way I found to improve yourself is to do your own retrospective. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and learn from from that retrospective and take it on to, uh, to subsequent projects as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just learning from others, I think sometimes on those retrospectives or quite often, not sometimes. You don't have to necessarily be the one experiencing the situation yourself, but just sitting there and listening right. to how others have gone through it is a perfect opportunity to learn from them without having to make the mistake yourself in the first place. I've shared I've shared my mistakes in my classes that I teach so that my students never make the same mistake I've made. They there's no reason for them to make the mistake if they have the good education. That's right, absolutely, and it's and it starts with you sharing uh, that you've you've. You know that you've identified a way to improve or to do something a little differently in retrospect. Yeah, makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. Uh, and, and Carolina, would you like to, to share a view as well on, on that particular question? 
yeah, retrospective, of course, and for me also feedback that, of course, can be understood as a part of retrospective. But the, the first thing to improve something, we need to understand what we are doing in not so perfect way, right? That's kind of obvious. And for me, the starting point is to understand that, well, we are not illicit and document information for ourselves, right? This is right. not done that I'm doing for myself. I am providing input for business to understand the scope. To understand the approach, I am providing input for development team. Yeah, and the quality of requirements is basically determined by by de their experience. So for me to understand what can be improved is to understand how they treat, how they consider my outputs. This is the first start. This is the starting point, right? Asking for feedback. And personally, I prefer and it. It, it will sound strange, but I prefer personally prefer to think about what you guys need at the very, very beginning. So that my elicitation is, um, well, my elicitation works are started taking into account the information already provided by stakeholders, what information I should collect. So that, again, I am not wasting time, people, the team, all the persons involved, asking questions, collecting information that will appear to be not complete. Yeah, so for me, all the things that actually we are mentioning, elicitation, documentation, specification, quality of information are linked together and we cannot separate that. Otherwise we will end up with situation, oh my gosh, I make a mistake, I could do things better, but I am, I am learning that after the fact and that's not really perfect situation, yeah? That's so right. I prefer prevent these situations by talking, just talking with people, guys, I am going to collect information. This information will be input for your development, testing, whatever. What information I need to provide to you? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. This is and an I, approach that I, I think could be quite useful. Yeah, I would, I would totally agree. And, and, and sometimes, or quite often, actually, as BAs, we don't find ourselves joining a project right at the start and, and with the developers, with the project managers, all learning together. Quite often, we find ourselves joining a different stage, maybe to replace a, a, a previous business analyst uh, in some cases. So in those situations, absolutely spending the time with the development team, with the architects, with the business, finding out some of those areas that they've already considered could be improved uh, and making sure that we are the ones that improve them from the start. Understanding what lessons they'd already identified, perhaps from other retrospectives, perhaps from previous feedback, and that they'd already put into practice so that you don't end up taking them backwards in terms of their their approaches as well is particularly key and, uh, and and i think just just by probably by those conversations at the start is a good way of getting the mentality going from from the start of my engagement as an example of being open and making sure that we we're encouraging uh, each other to share what we think we could do a little bit better or where there's improvements can be made you know and, and definitely leading by example is probably the best way to do that and encourage people to share with me if they think oh, I could do things a little bit better, you know, and hopefully they will. Uh, one thing that I also, me. one more thing that I would like to, um, to add is, I don't know what is your experience, Tia and uh, John, but my experience is that very often we are focusing only on the project realization phase, and we are forgetting that the solution, the system will be used, will be maintained for a long time, and we are building everything on the assumptions that our goal is to complete the project. And that's a kind of pain because this way we will collect the scope, information that is necessary to actually run the project and deliver something. And this information appears uh, to be not sufficient for people who will maintain, who will develop the product after release. Yeah, so I know it's difficult, but what I also recommend people to 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 ask to to do is to think about the whole product, the whole life cycle of the business need, not only about the project realization. And my experience is that it really changed the mindset and the perspective. Yeah, I encourage my architects and developers to write the documents for the people who are maintaining the 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 application. Mm -hmm or the system, because somebody's got to maintenance it. Somebody's going to be making changes in the future. They're going to want to know, where did you put all the stuff? How do they get to it? Are there, is there security attached to it? Um, if we don't do that, we haven't finished the project well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, it, and I think there's I think the sound of ice here, I would say, and, and certainly I think you can, to an extent, you know, ask those individuals to put themselves in the shoes of the people that are going to support and maintain the, the solution. But mm -hmm. it's, and, and that's definitely something we, would, we should do, as is bringing in um, people that are already maintaining maybe the system we're working on, or at least systems in that general area, so they can provide their own on the ground experience of the organization, what they might need as well, to make sure that we uh, we don't miss that point Caroline made, which is uh, right. which is absolutely valid, of course. We also try to document all of our, our QA tests in a location so that if it has to be retested in the future, somebody doesn't have to go in and rewrite the tests. They know what it was done, they know what the results were, they know when it was run, on what system, which environment, et cetera. It helps everything in the future. And that, that transparency is, is really important, isn't it? Because it's, it's this one aspect there, I know you touched on, one aspect of maintaining that transparency and whether it's sharing information on the requirements, the tests, or any other right. aspects that you've gathered um, can, can actually enable those subsequent BAs or subsequent projects okay. to be able to access uh, the information in, a, in an easy way with that and start all over again. Right. Naming conventions on all of this, the documents that you create, the tests that you've run, everything needs to be written for someone who doesn't know anything about the application. So when people walk into it, they don't have to try to translate, you know, some code that the project team was using, or, you know, some abbreviation or whatever. Just make it easy for everyone to understand whenever they know nothing about it. And what is also important that I think that you had in in, in your in your head is actually transparency and traceability that is mm -hmm. also sometimes missed. And we have a bunch of requirements, we have a bunch of test cases, designs, whatever, no links between these artifacts. And we have a problem in case there is any change in the scope, we have problems in identification. What is the impact of this change? Yeah, it is especially important when we are talking about maintenance phase. I encourage traceability, good luck. I encourage our user stories and our test cases to all actually document which requirement they're meeting. Uh, if it's, you know, very, very infrequently will a, a user story or a test case fully test a single requirement, but they can always identify which one they roll back up to. Yeah. And on a similar point, I mean, I think when we're talking about requirements for the first time and meeting stakeholders for the first time, the reason why we're doing that is almost certainly because we have a scope uh, we have some objectives and some visions. So making sure that we don't forget that or over, overlook that from the start is important. That'll make traceability quite easy. Um, sure. And similarly, if we are focused on a product and not necessarily the holistic set of business requirements, then quite likely we might already have some broader business requirements to rely on. And it's about thinking about that, thinking about process and how that connects as well to what we're doing. They're all there to make... Uh, to make our life easier in the first instance, to give us some context so we'll know what we're going into, but then retrospectively to enable others who haven't benefited from that conversation to be able to understand why we've, we've put some requirements forward. Well, it's because they link to certain processes we've discussed or certain situations or certain scope that we've looked at as well. And if you make that part of the conversation, it, it, it makes it a lot easier to manage later on and their traceability becomes a focus. Right. And if you have a project that you decide that you've got to cut part of it out, it's a whole lot easier to figure out which pieces are attached to that part that you want to cut out if they're well documented. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Trace traceability will definitely be a topic for another day. That in itself is uh, is something that I, I know personally, I'm sure we both can as well, and probably speak to for a lot longer than the, the 45 minutes we've got today. But that's on the list for anyone uh, interested. Um, I'd be interested as well to get your perspective on that when it comes to gathering requirements and solicitation, whether you see any um, any differences between the way that an analyst should may, uh, may act or may, may behave or may uh, their, their techniques and approaches between whether they're an working in an agile environment or maybe a waterfall environment or maybe even somewhere in between. Do you see any particular differences in the way that, that you would expect people to behave around around their solicitation anyway? Every time you have a change of requirements, every time you gather a new requirement, you have to go back and reevaluate all of the requirements you've gathered so far uh, to be sure that there's no contradictions or no changes to those. 
whenever you're in a waterfall environment, that's not so hard because you haven't started development. I mean, you get all your requirements before you do any development or any changes. So that that just means that you can focus solely on your elicitation and documentation and clarification. If you're in an agile environment and that happens, uh, it may impact the development itself, especially if development on that on one of those requirements is has already begun or is underway or is completed. There may be some, uh, you know, rewiring of the system required at that point. And it honestly, for that only, only that reason, agile is more challenging for a BA. Um, there is a million reasons it's much better. But for that reason, you have to be aware of the, all the development all the time, what has been worked on so that you can raise the flag of, wait, before y'all start that ticket, we need to clarify this other point. And so you have to keep your head in both worlds. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Carolyn, do you have any, anything you would like to add on that point? Yeah. I completely agree that while the change management could be challenging, um, the fact that we are working in agile or non-agile, for me personally, I don't like this classification agile and non-agile because, well, from the business pers business analysis perspective, if you will think about the core idea of business analysis, and if you will think about agile and non-agile, business analysis is, for me, the same. The thing that is different is the way of formality of the process, is the timing, are the relationship, is the extent that of change management. But the techniques can be used exactly the same. Yeah, and, and I and I absolutely agree. And I'm very glad that, that you said that particular point. And uh, as with the point Sophia made a moment ago, because I often see examples where a bit of clients or stakeholders are expecting to see an agile incarnation of a BA and then a waterfall incarnation of a BA and expects them to do quite different things. And uh, I think no. for anyone that's had the benefit of being in both camps and being on um, uh, an agile project, for example, then they'll recognize the benefits of collaborating closely with your stakeholders and your development team and, and, and your testers and your architects all at once, and be able to feed in the lessons you're learning from them um, and, and, uh, and, and turn that back into your your own approach and you know, have that influence your approach and i think most i think certainly for myself having been involved in agile and waterfall projects i like to adopt a lot of mentalities and approaches particularly around a collaboration that i would be expected to do maybe from an agile perspective and that is making sure that we are getting involved and collaborating closely with the entire delivery team making sure that i'm on hand to understand their questions the points we've made at the start up front but be available as well because questions will evolve as they go through the development. We don't, we don't expect them just to get one opportunity to ask us questions and then that's it, it's locked in. You know, so yeah, so I'm very glad you you made that that uh, you, you you almost said the same thing I would do as well. But uh, <laughs> it's 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 interesting to make sure that I wasn't going mad and thinking that uh, agile BAs. You know was, something, John, because I, it's quite funny. I, I know many people who are struggling with, okay, okay, we are agile, you are not agile, oh my gosh, so bad. But if you will think about the idea, again, for me, agile, not agile, water for rational unified, again, this is, this is a tool, right? And the tool can be ad adapted to the context. So why can't we involve customers and the team if you are working in waterfall? Why can't? Right. We can, right? Nobody Absolutely. said it's forbidden. Yeah. No, that's right. <laughs> and, and to your point, it's the, it's the techniques that they're using and, and their, yes. their experience, which is the most important thing. Because actually, if we take all of the methodologies away, we take all of the projects away, the BA role is fundamentally about interacting with individuals and, uh, and, and representing some stakeholders, eliciting information from others. And, you know, the, the same good practices will apply whether you walked for agile, hybrid sure. or something else. You know. Even if you are working in pure agile, who said it must be a user story? Nobody said that. Yeah, you can use different techniques, really. The I'm question really... is, well, the question, the challenge is select the techniques that will be effective in a given context. And what Tia said, consider the change, right? Mm -hmm. For me personally, the challenge related with agile projects is that 
we are changing things and we are losing the idea from from our eyes yeah and in and the end we are uh, consuming resources we are doing something we are not delivering value and it's not agile this is not agile guys yeah, yeah. that's a challenge yes the whole the whole purpose of agile is to improve communication and make it work better for your team in your project at that moment and that's why you're supposed to change along with what your needs are you can do the same thing with waterfall as long as your organization doesn't have very very strict guidelines as to how you run waterfall yeah yeah, yeah the fundamentally if you're in an agile project you have to have an adaptive and an agile mindset to adjust your approaches and the way you work depending on the situation, depending on the team, depending on certain circumstances that arise. Otherwise, um, just using some of the agile ceremonies is really not going to provide any benefit to you. And of course, all those things we've mentioned, they're all soft skills that um, can be applied to waterfall, whether you're BA or otherwise. So yeah, so thank you again. I'm glad, glad uh, we're on the same page on that one, but it is always nice to, to make sure that uh, we're not going mad uh, when we ask these questions. And so I guess the, the next question I have in the, to in the topic of requirement solicitation as well is really just to seek your advice on how do you think other BAs out there can improve the way that they elicit and gather requirements uh, um, in the future? You know, so obviously mentioned a few things, but are there, are there any other additional pieces of advice that you might want to share? Uh, probably two that I think are most critical that I would like to bring forth. One is have a framework for your requirements that is logical based upon the scope of the project. Uh, you know, we're going, let's say we're talking about a website. And so we're going to have requirements about the header. We're going to have requirements about the menu. We're going to have requirements about, you know, the different pieces so that people can easily understand what it is you're going for. Not only does that help them understand your requirements, but it gives them confidence that you're considering everything. And if you miss something, they can bring it to your attention. Uh, that way you've got everything covered. The second thing is, is have your requirements documented in a place once you get them a little bit cleaned up so that everyone can see them. Be very transparent about what you have so that if there's anyone that has any confusion or concern or contradiction, that they can bring it forth and you can have good clean requirements by the time you get ready for development. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with both those points. And, and Car Caroline. Actually, Tia, the second point, it has a name. It's a requirements validation and I'm perfectly for it. Yeah. As soon as, soon as we collect information, put it somewhere where it can be validated. This is something mm -hmm. that we are missing. We are just taking information, compiling some requirements documentation, done perfect right it's oh perfect. no no oh, we no. we have a rule about validation you validate it with the people you gather requirements from and then you validate it with anyone who may have input but i mm -hmm. i think we need to go to the third step and publicize the requirements to everyone so that the entire project or anybody else that maybe not mm -hmm. involved in the project but are interested in it maybe downstream people uh, they can look at it and say wait that you can't do that because you don't have that opportunity if you don't publicize. That's it. That, so, it's one of those fundamentals that I'd say that we we should well, we are, well certainly I do, but we should all be thinking about it as part of our initial what is our approach and our plan regarding the analysis. One of those big topics should be, well, how do we ensure transparency from the very start? So even on the first few days when we've just all we might have is scope, how can we put that somewhere where all of our subsequent stakeholders we're going to work with can access it? And the team can access it as well. So there's plenty of good tools out there. There's SharePoint, there's Confluence, there's creating internal websites. I'm sure there's probably uh, uh, 50 plus other places we can put it to make sure that all of the stakeholders have that transparency on uh, what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and, that, and the evolution and that encouragement then to report back if they see anything that uh, they don't agree with or that we need to change a little bit. Right. So, yeah, very sound advice. One thing that I would also wanted to add that very often we are mixing requirements with actually implementation with designs and requirements from definition, they should not imply the design. Yeah, so oh, right. That's right. Uh, yeah. Well, don't ask questions like this customer, do you want to have a PDF report? Because PDF 
actually it's not about the need it's not about requirements it's actually going into solution yeah, yeah and if you will change the way of asking questions the way of thinking about the needs and requirements then you will realize that okay generating a report in pdf it's actually a solution the real need could be something completely different the real need can be john needs information and john really doesn't care is it in pdf sms or whatever that's right. right and we are mixing things together very often and, and that, I mean, that, that's probably a, a very good place to to end actually with that with that open point here to making sure that when we do um, speak to stakeholders that we're not boxing them into a, into a corner and that we're actually giving them the opportunity to to without the the constraints of thinking about a particular solution tell us what they really need and I think uh, right. which is fundamentally the value that BA is adding uh, in a elicitation perspective which is asking those open questions so we hear all of the information from the stakeholder rather than only hearing what we are what we want to hear or what we've right. forced them into telling us. So there you go. Excellent point probably to, to at least end uh, this particular session on anyway. You've also uh, contributed as well to a few other example sessions that we should have in the future. Traceability be one perfectly good example of that. Probably transparency is a topic in itself as well. But um, I would certainly like to thank you for and thank you, Carolina, as well, for your time. I'm really interested in, as expected, to hear from you. I'm sure the rest of the BA community would uh, definitely enjoy listening to this as well. So I'll be sharing that. But um, thank you again. And uh, look forward to hearing from you and seeing, uh, seeing from you in the future. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you both. Bye.